Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today's episode, we are going to do a deep dive analysis of Dr. Dawson Church's book, Mind to Matter. Now, the reason I'm, I'm doing this review is it's a fantastic book that goes to the core of proving this model, the idea that our thoughts can change reality. And it's a wonderful book. And I wanted to bring some of the knowledge that I got from this book to you. And more importantly, in a couple days, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Dawson Church. And I cannot even come close to telling you how excited I am about this. Dr. Church is amazing. And I would not be interviewing him. He uh, had asked to come on the show. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Church. Dr. Church is an award-winning author whose best-selling book, The Genie in Your Genes, has been hailed as a breakthrough in the field of epigenetics. Dawson has published numerous scientific papers with a focus on the remarkable self-healing mechanisms now emerging at the intersection of emotion and gene expression. He applies these breakthroughs to health and athletic performance through EFTUniverse.com, has written several books that are fantastic on EFT, and I've talked about that a a little bit on the show, but uh, if you get a chance, look up EFT. It's an incredible technique that you can use to balance and modulate your emotions. Dawson was educated at Baylor University and Hollows University, where he earned his doctorate under the tuition of Harvard-trained neurosurgeon Norm Sheely, MD, PhD, with whom he co-authored Soul Medicine, Awakening Your Inner a Blueprint for Abundant Health and Energy, another terrific book that I highly recommend. Dawson is editor emeritus of the peer-reviewed journal Energy Psychology, Theory, Research, and Treatment, and founded the nonprofit Soul Medicine Institute to research and train practitioners in energy psychology. Dawson works with businesses and sports teams to achieve peak performance. And you can check him out on Dawson at DawsonChurch.com. But in my mind, I are always looked at Dawson Church like he's a doctor in the same level as Dr. Joe Dispenza and Bruce Lipton, all those guys. And I thought he would probably be in some kind of deep study. The possibility of being able to interview him is so wonderful, especially because it's a book that I've listened to two times and then read once. And I was thinking, I'm going to do this interview. I'd like to go back and go over this book a little bit. And I thought, why not do it for the podcast? And if you haven't heard of it, I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Church is a terrific writer. And I do think that you will still carry a lot from the book. Everybody knows I have lots of love for Dr. Joe Dispenza. His work is amazing. His meditations are amazing. And Dr. Dispenza has a forward to Dr. Church's book. And in his foreword, he talks about how he met Dawson. He, they met at, at a conference and they were obviously, you know, uh, they, they felt like they had a lot of come. He knew instantaneously they were going to be friends. But uh, Dr. Dispenza says, Dawson is one of those people. I can email or call and ask, how long does it take for trauma to consolidate in the brain as a long-term memory? And he will, without hesitation, tell me the exact time it takes, the best reference, the particular research studies, as well as the scientist who conducted those studies. It's as if he were giving me directions to the local supermarket. When I discovered this, that's when I realized I was not working with an average scientist. I was in the presence of a supermind. Dawson is brilliant, charismatic, loving, and full of life. He and I share a passion to understand and to know more about who we really are and what is possible for human beings, especially during those present times of change. Dr. Dispenza goes on to say that he loved reading this book because it provided answers to some of his own personal questions about the relationship between mind and the material world, as well as connection between energy and matter. I learned new concepts and it 
helped him to see the world differently. He says he was changed from his time reading it. And it is his hope that it will not only change all of us and help you to see the world differently, but will also inspire you to apply the principle so that you embody the truth of what is possible for you in your life. He goes on to say, if science is the new language of mysticism, then you are learning from a contemporary mystic. My dear friend Dawson Church, he wants you to become your own mystic too, and to prove to yourself that your thoughts matter. They literally become matter. So that gives you a little bit of background about Dr. Church. He's a great writer, but he really does go about establishing the the idea that our thoughts can actually create matter and affect matter and looks at the science of this. Of course, he starts with, you know, the idea that thoughts become things. This is manifestly true. I am sitting in this chair talking to you right now. This chair that I'm sitting in began as a thought in someone's mind, every detail of it. The frame, the fabric, the curves, the color. Thoughts do become things. He points out, of course, you know, he'll never be a quarterback for the NFL, no matter how earnestly and he thinks about it. He'll never be 16 years old again. And he'll never pilot the Starship Enterprise. It's an interesting um, beginning, and I always come back to that when I think about this book. He points out, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that that try to sell that anything can be created with the mind. And I have said that, and I still believe that. But some things would require a tremendous amount of energy. And uh, like, for instance, you're you're not going to be a quarterback in the NFL if you're 50 years old. Maybe you could, but but the probability field of that path will be very difficult and it will require a huge energy shift to move you into a variation where that's possible. But what he was interested with this book is between the ways in which thoughts become things and the ways in which thoughts can never become things, there is a wide middle ground and the book explores this middle ground. And, and why, why does he do this? Because we want to be able to create the outermost limits of our thought, expanding our lives to the limits of our potential. We want to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise, fulfilled, creative, and loved as possible. We also don't want to chase pipe dreams, thoughts that are never going to become things. When we apply the rigorous standards of science to the inquiry that middle ground turns out to be enormous, research shows us that with thought used deliberately, we can create things beyond the ordinary. That is his assertion. And the idea that thoughts are things has become a meme in popular culture. It's held as a firm proposition in metaphysics. And some spiritual teachers ascribe infinite powers to the mind. Yet there are clearly limits to human creative abilities. I cannot manifest an aircraft carrier simply by thinking about one. I cannot become Indonesian, jump over Mount Everest, or turn lead into gold. But new discoveries in epigenetics, neuroscience, electromagnetism, psychology, cymatics, public health, and quantum physics, however, are showing that thoughts can be profoundly creative. The device that you're listening to this or watching this right now was created as a thought. And so was democracy, bikinis, space travel, immunization, money, the four-minute mile in the assembly line, as Dr. Church puts it. Dr. Church explores this interaction between the scientist and the mystic something that dr dispenza talks about in his in his forward if you read the rest of it uh, and science and metaphysics are, are generally considered to be polar opposite opposites in many ways and science 
is experimental, practice, practical, rigorous, empirical, materialistic, objective, and intellectual, and metaphysics, which is a, a lot of times what I'm, I'm dealing with on this podcast. And I would hope that I'm dealing with both. I treat science just the same, but metaphysics is spiritual, experiential, abstract, mystical, ephemeral, internal, irreplaceable, imprecise, subjective, otherworldly, impractical, and impossible to prove. Science studies the world of matter, while metaphysics seeks to transcend it. And I agree with Dr. Church that science and metaphysics have should not be perceived as separated. And he is delighted in both being a mystic and a scientific researcher. And I have to say, I'm the same way. I'm not sitting in a lab coat in a, in a doing research, but I would sure love to. There's a lot of questions that I have about the stuff that we're working on. And it absolutely demands further research and I would love for scientific studies to merit out some of the assertions we're making about reality shifts, reality transurfing, some of these things are amazing. And I don't think that they're separate. And the the book the mind to matter that it examines the science behind the creative powers of the mind. It, it reviews the studies that show step by step exactly how the mind creates material form. I know there are people listening to this that still doubt the creative power of thought. They think it's all hokey or woohoo type of talk. And I'm pointing this book out to you, the people that listen to this podcast, because we talk about very heady and complicated stuff on this podcast, parallel realities and physics, but the core thing to understand that starts everything else is the creative power of our minds, that our minds are influencing our environment. I still have people that will argue with me that do not believe that, that they are creating or choosing realities with their own mind. Now, in some accounts, what we talk about in reality transurfing and, and in other episodes, we're talking about choosing a reality. This is also going to the idea that you're, you can directly affect matter with your mind. And it's pretty amazing. This book has case histories real up close authentic personal accounts of people who had an experience of mind into matter drawn from the worlds of medicine psychology sports business and scientific discovery these stories run the gamut from profound to inspiring to heart-wrenching and they show that thoughts can become things in ways that stretch the fabric of our space-time reality There is an amazing story that Dr. Church tells at the beginning of the book that is very relevant to recent episodes of the reality revolution. And he is talking about writing his first book and he decides that he wants to swim as well while he's working on his book because he's working in Hawaii. He wor- decides to work in Hawaii so he won't get distracted. And he goes out and he, and he found has these cool spots and he has his jacket on. He puts his keys in his jacket and doesn't think and then jumps in the ocean, plays around for a while and then gets back out and he reaches in to his jacket and his keys are gone. And so then he knew, well, this is going to be tough, but he didn't panic. And he's focused on his heart. He continued to focus on his heart and just imagined his keys coming back to him. It's no big deal. So then what happens is he just goes along the beach, doesn't start getting scared or anything, looking around for it, scanning around. He is something, he sees a father and his son out swimming on the ocean and just, he gets a little nudge, perhaps a rustle uh, of the morning stars. 
and goes out and asks them if they found anything in uh, when they were diving down to the bottom. And so this kid pulled up some keys in his hand. Somebody actually found keys that he had lost in the ocean. That is amazing. And he repeatedly, when he, when he wasn't having success, focused on his heart. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's so synchronous with what we've been talking about in the ways that the heart is the key to outer intention and the heart is the key to doing all kinds of things. So, and he talks about how he tried to look at this as a skeptic, as a scientist, knowing that there's not a logical explanation for this. And then he just just happened, but he just went through the possibilities of it and still thinks that this, you know, it's pretty unbelievable. It was all a matter of random chance. But after decades of hundreds of similar experiences, Dr. Church, his skeptic's mind has to think again. How can so many highly unlikely things come together at once to produce a desired result? And so he has this quest to determine if there's any scientific link between thoughts and things. And as a researcher, he conducted many clinical trials. The editor of the peer-reviewed journal Energy Psychology and a science blogger for Huffington Post, he read all or part of more than a thousand scientific studies per year. He started to see a pattern. There are multiple links in the chain between thoughts and things, and he realized that science could explain many of them. He wondered if anyone had ever contacted, connected all the dots to see how strong the evidence was, and where was the chain strongest, and where was the links missing. And so if he were to treat the idea of the mind creating matter as a scientific rather than a metaphysical hypothesis, would it hold up? And he began seeking out research that addressed this question and interviewing some of the brightest minds in the field. And with mounting excitement, he realizes as the, as the book goes along that much of the evidence was hiding in plain sight, like pearls scattered in the sand. But no one had strung the facts together in a necklace before. Most of the research is new and pieces of it are astonishing. The research talked about in this book is amazing. Nobel Prize winning physician Eric Kandel showed when we pass signals through a neural bundle in our brains, that bundle grows rapidly. The number of connections can double in just one hour of repeated stimulation. Our brains are rewiring themselves along the pathways of our neural activity in real time. So as the thoughts and feelings of our consciousness are carried through our neural network, they trigger the expression of genes. And these in turn trigger the synthesis of proteins in our cells. And these cellular events produce electrical and magnetic fields that can be measured by sophisticated medical imaging devices such as an EEG and an MRI. And I wanted to mention he has a section in here on the 11 dimensional universe. Um, the, the next set of ideas was more challenging. The world of quantum physics is so strange, as Church says, that it confounds our conventional experience of space and time. String theory posits that we perceive as physical matter is actually composed of strings of energy. And what we measure as heavy molecules are fast-moving energy strings. And while what we experience as light molecules are energy strings that are vibrating more slowly, the closer science looks at matter, the more it looks like pure energy. And string theory requires a universe with 11 dimensions, not just four required by fat classical physics. So how do our four dimensional brains contemplate 11 dimensions? He references Niels Bohr, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. He quotes Einstein, a human being is part of the whole called up by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. When we begin to free ourselves from this prison, as Einstein phrased it, then we expand our consciousness to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature. Our consciousness interacts with the energy of the universe. A, a big concept 
in this book is the idea of the non-local mind. Physician Larry Dorsey calls this expansive consciousness that embraces the whole of nature the non-local mind. And while and he in this book will mention nature a lot of times as a, a link to the non-local larger mind. And I found that's very fascinating. I repeatedly come back to that when I think, hey, I want to go for a hike today, you know, and I'm I'm reminded of Dr. Church's research that really there's more to just going to a hike than going on a hike because it's kind of like you're in pure, pure source and as he calls the non-local mind. And while we live our lives in our local minds in ordinary reality, we're unconscious participants in the larger consciousness of non-local mind. Moments of synchronicity like finding keys remind us of the presence of non-local mind. Larry Dossi presents compelling evidence for the existence of non-local mind and inspires with the potential of living our local lives in synchrony to it. Nobel Prize winning physicist Eugene Wigner, he cites, says that the very, the very study of the external world led to the scientific conclusion that the content of the consciousness is the ultimate reality. Though there are many definitions of consciousness, the one that Dawson Church uses is simply being aware and the way we use consciousness the way we direct our awareness produces profound and immediate changes in the atoms and molecules of our bodies science shows us that our consciousness affects the material world around us as our consciousness changes so changes the world so this should give you a pretty good idea of what he's talking about in this book. And he starts off the first chapter at how our brains shape the world and cites several studies about the speed of neural change and increasing the mass of the brain's most used regions. There's some evidence that mindfulness changes the changes the brain and he cites some studies there's a bunch of interesting studies to unpack in this chapter and that's a definite reason to get the book and check it out but what he's talking about is emotional regulation and the emotions and how it can affect your functioning of your brain and the way that and the parts of the brain that are tasked with emotional regulation and how they deal with memory and awareness. So it's very interesting discussion of that. He claims that we ha- all have an everyday superpower. This everyday superpower that you possess, second to second, you are changing your brain by the way you use your mind. The consciousness of your mind is becoming the cells of the matter of your brain. He goes on to cite electrical conductors generating energy fields. And there's a discussion of electrical activity and energy fields in the brain. The antenna in our cells explaining that the neurons in your brain act like magnets. They generate fields and these fields shape the matter around them just the way that magnets cause iron filings to form symmetrical patterns. Bigger fields outside the body, such as gravitational field of the earth, act like the biggest magnet. They shift the pattern of your body's fields. They act on your brain and your cells, while your body also exerts a tiny influence on those bigger fields. Our bodies are influencing these big fields while also being influenced by them. That's amazing. Your body's electromagnetic field extends five yards or meters from your body according to Dr. Church. And when you're five meters away from another person, your field begins interacting with their field. The two of you might be saying nothing, yet your energy fields are shaping each other in an invisible dance of communication. You know, for decades, Dr. Church claims that microtubules with their rigid form were assumed to be no more than structural elements of the cell, 
just as your body has a skeleton that provides a rigid structure to which structures of the body attach microtubules are the grinders and scaffolding of the cell however like antenna microtubules are hollow and they are long cylinders this property allows them to resonate like a drum so when you hear people talking about vibration resonating and like antenna their structure makes them capable of receiving signals from energy fields according to Hameroff and Penrose and microtubule signaling has been proposed as a method by which the body's complex systems are coordinated among trillions of cells there's a really interesting story that Dr. Church cites of a man that's his heart is completely clogged he's a cardiac patient he he's he can die at any time doctors when they give him the the treadmill test he's they're so worried about him they make him stop and it's really bad and so they go in and they're looking at removing these blockages and so he goes in the next day the day before the surgery and he had woke up just feeling just so much better all of a sudden for no reason and he goes and talks to the doctor and they did the tests and there was no blockages. And then he later found out when his friend Lauren Smith, a, an Indian medicine man in California, assembled a group of students and they did a ceremony and they covered another man with bay leaves and said his name was Richard, which is the, the guy that did this. And for the next hour they prayed and sang and moved and the next day he was healed and when Dr. Church followed up 13 years later, the man was still in great health. It's amazing. You can direct your consciousness the way that people do in this case where they have these healings. Consciousness isn't something that you simply is. It's something that can be controlled and pointed in a desired direction. And when you direct your consciousness you harness the power of your mind activate the splendid machinery of your brain and influence the environment around you you do that in visibly obvious ways like deciding to plant a vegetable garden after your mind makes the decision you use your consciousness to direct the project he asks you to take a look around you right now the colors in the carpet began as a thought in someone's mind that that person chose the particular shades and textures that wound up in the finished product someone else decided the dimensions of your cell phone and the laptop computer every proportion in your home began as a thought in the consciousness of the builder we use invisible fields such as cell signals bluetooth and wireless networks every day and a wireless network uses a router to send a signal into the surrounding environment and in the presence of a receiver such as your smartphone or laptop the information is exchanged the field of energy created by the router makes the communication possible through the fields we can do amazing things and though the fields are invisible they are efficient conductors of information even electricity can now be transmitted wirelessly from one device to another you also interact with your environment to invisible ways through the energy fields in which you're immersed through your brain mind cells your consciousness projects signals into the fields around you he cites Tesla who says if you wish to find the secrets of the universe think in terms of energy frequency and vibration in the second chapter he talks about how energy builds matter and there's a really very interesting discussion of electromagnetic fields and how they're everywhere and how these fields create the shapes of molecules it's, <laughs> it's amazing stuff he talks about water and healing and cymatics how frequency can change matter I love to tune frequencies in the background that you're hearing now and he's saying that this these sound vibrations have great power he, he cites examples of that we've talked about on this podcast with dr. Moto and the way that water interacts with the with thoughts and vibrations and energy it's pretty interesting 
third chapter of this book is how our emotions organize our environment there's a very nuanced discussion of brain waves and moving into brainwave states what the brain waves in the awakened mind looks like uh, he talks about he has an eco meditation um, where they use different med meditation with they use different interactions of different brain waves it's very interesting and the way that brain waves can express the fields generated by emotions and so as they study these brain waves they're finding that emotions are the key And he goes into a discussion about the experience of mystics and the mystical experience that's also very fascinating. He has some examples of theta waves and healing, consciousness shifts in the brain and the way the brain processes information. He has a fantastic chapter on how energy regulates DNAs and cells in the body. And the beginning of this chapter is just absolutely fantastic and really made me and I come back to this one as well a lot for the way he talks about the way the energy regulates our DNA and the way that we're, our bodies are shifting and constantly changing he says you are not the same person you were a second ago let alone yesterday your body is replacing cells and rejuvenating its systems at a frantic pace your body contains some 37 trillion cells. That's a much bigger number than the count of galaxies in the known universe. Old cells are dying and new ones replacing them all the time. Each second, over 810,000 cells are being replaced. Your body produces 1 trillion new red blood cells per day. That's a big number. With all its zeros, it can be expressed as 1 billion. As they circulate through your veins and arteries, red blood cells carry oxygen and nutrients to every other cell in your body. Each cell has a lifetime of about four months, after which the liver extracts its vital ingredients and sends the rest to the spleen for recycling. You don't have a single red blood cell in your body that you had six months ago. Every one has been replaced. The lining of your digestive tract undergoes rapid turnover it's replaced every four days your lung tissue every eight days even the densest of tissues your bones are constantly regenerating with 10 percent of your skeleton being replaced each year there are 84 billion neurons in the brain along with a similar number of non-neural cells our brains are growing new neural cells continuously and each cell can connect with thousands of others weaving an interconnected web of an estimated 100 and 50 trillion synapses our brains are replacing at least one neuron per second that's an amazing <laughs> grouping of information there and it really makes you think and realize how your body's adapting and changing and that your cells regenerate in these fields that your mind creates he has established that emotions create these fields that they can regulate these fields that energy builds matter and that that our thoughts end up building matter and it's pretty amazing there's a fantastic power uh, there's a fantastic chapter on the power of coherent mind and in this one he gives one of the most specific examples that can scientifically show you personally that your mind can change matter and he calls it his eureka moment where what he did was he um he got the equipment required he got a geiger counter and a smoke detector containing an american 241 disc the methodology was elementary either a healer could slow down the rate of radioactive decay or he could not a geiger counter can be ma can measure radiation as either microsieverts a standard scientific unit or counts per minute so he set up the equipment on his dining room table and figured out how to get a basic radiation reading. He discovered that the baseline in his house fluctuated between 12 and 22 CPM. He then placed the, the Geiger counter over the radiation source, a simple household smoke detector, 
The radiation is raising road to, rose to 60 CPM. Just a couple of inches away, the readings were normal. A Geiger counter had has to be very close to a smoke detector to measure any radiation since the devices are designed to be safe for household installation. So he performed seven steps of what he calls his eco meditation and then filled his mind with the same image, the, the same image of the rock that he had done before. And he was able to increase the reading on the Geiger counter up to 80 CPM. He then went away from it and checked it after 10 minutes. It was still at 80 CPM and then went away from it and then came back to it after an hour and it went back down to 60 CPM. It's research like that that really validates the idea that our thoughts can affect matter. We can literally affect the radioactive rate that's measured by a Geiger counter. So he goes on to look at the way that global coherence can affect things and scientific belief systems, the observer effect, and, and he talks about quantum entanglement. And he does mention that we can, personal coherence can actually increase global coherence and give some examples of that, which gives us an idea that we should continue to cultivate the idea of a coherent mind. There is a terrific chapter on synchronicity that is fantastic he really when i finished this book i really got created as part of my intention to look for synchronicities more of course talking about this stuff all the time we're always talking about synchronicity but his discussion of it was particularly unique and i really appreciated uh, his descriptions of synchronicity then his final chapter is thinking beyond the local mind and one of my favorite chapters in the book it's it's talking about how his personal experiences when he's out in the woods and how the how the forest in the woods is similar to the non-local mind and when we are a part of that we are sharing with that non-local source mind and it really emphasized Hey, you, if you want to access source directly, you can tune into this field by going in, by going into nature. And he, he gives a good argument for why that's true, but he does argue that we need to live in attunement with the universal field. And he talks about what he calls the resonant symphony of the all mind and letting go this illusion of our locality that we are one with the universe. And he emphasizes at the end the importance of alignment. Now there's no way I could give a proper review of this book in just this short limited time. I wish I could do the same kind of deep dive that I, I do on some of the reality transurfing stuff. But this information in here is incredibly well researched and well explained. You know, and if you have somebody out there that says, I'm sorry, but thoughts don't have an effect on reality. That stuff is woo-woo and it doesn't make sense. But there's a call at the end of this book that we can reach world peace and compassion and beauty and opportunity and wisdom in this future. And it's a hopeful vision. It's a hopeful vision. When you consider the idea that our thoughts recreate reality, then we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility for the future to make this a great planet, to do great things, and to, to allow for greater levels of peace and joy throughout the world. I believe that we can do these things. I think it's possible. So I can't wait to interview Dr. Church and we're definitely going to go into some of this stuff some more, but I'd recommend that you check this out. Keep an eye out for the upcoming interview. 
All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. For coaching, go to advancedsuccessinstitute.com. You can email me anytime at media at advancedsuccessinstitute.com. It's always a joy to share this time with you. And until we meet again, welcome to The Reality Revolution.